know that feeling that you got in the pit of your stomach the night before Christmas? Now times it by a million. It's Michigan versus Ohio State. It's a war. It's been going on for a hundred years. The maize and blue versus the scarlet and gray. Good versus evil. Ohio State being the bad guys. Michigan people aren't to be liked. Go blue. This game makes or breaks the season. Hardcore smash mouth football. That's where I learned hatred. What's at stake? Bragging rights. Bragging rights. Bragging rights. Bragging rights. If you're able to win this game, you're buying peace. You lose 365 days of pain. You gotta win the battle. All hell will break loose. Every year on the third Saturday in November, amidst a Midwestern haze and the rustle of autumn leaves, the Michigan Wolverines and the Ohio State Buckeyes meet for a football game. Twelve months of fevered anticipation are played out on a frosted green canvas upon which strokes of maize and blue clash with scarlet and gray. Separated by less than 200 miles of heartland, these uneasy neighbors engage in one of the oldest and most deeply rooted rivalries in American sports. Predating baseball's first World Series by six years and the existence of the NFL by a quarter century. They're tearing down Michigan's covenant and club banner. It's football, spiked with an acute sense of identity. Since 1935, the game has been held on the final week of the regular season, with the Big Ten Conference Championship and a shot at a national title frequently at stake. But even in a down year, the chance to play spoiler to one's foe can be equally satisfying, turning a lost season into one of lasting triumph. Century. For a sacred 10-year period, two combative men inflamed this bitter rivalry while becoming folk heroes along the way. And for the players, who carry the weight of tradition on their shoulder pads, the results of these games forever define their legacy. Each university is steeped in proud custom, and for those to the north who have claimed to the winningest program in Division I history, tradition leads back to one man, a turn-of-the-century coach who made football an institution in Ann Arbor, the legendary Fielding Yost. His train lands here in 1901. He runs into an Ann Arbor news reporter who asks him about the coming season, and he says, Michigan will not lose a game all year, and they didn't in 1901. 1902, 1903, and 1904. Michigan truly was the champion of the West during the early years. During the first 15 games between Ohio State and Michigan, Ohio State won none of those games. Field Union's Michigan team in 1902 defeated Ohio State 86 to nothing. Even worse from the Ohio State standpoint is that game was called about halfway through the second half. The official simply brought the teams together and said, fellas, it's 86 to nothing. I think we've probably had about enough. And it wasn't until the 16th game of the series, which was 1919, that Ohio State finally was able to beat Michigan. And the guy that put Ohio State on the national map was Chick Harley. With only a single loss in three seasons, All-American Chick Harley brought the Buckeye program to national prominence and inspired the construction of Ohio Stadium, which opened in 1922 with a unique horseshoe design. While Ohioans were still admirably living off the land, Michigan's burgeoning automobile industry provided the state with newfound wealth and stature. 
By the time Michigan Stadium was completed in 1927, the state's social and economic upturn was reflected in the university's growth into one of the country's premier learning institutions. And with the advances of the 20th century came an aura of elitism amongst Michiganites. On the football field, the Wolverines continued to manufacture championships with assembly line proficiency. By 1933, Michigan had won eight national titles and had taken nine of its last 12 against Ohio State. The latest era began with the prolific Benny to Benny connection of quarterback Benny Friedman and receiver Benny Oosterbahn. And later included Grand Rapids raised future U.S. President Gerald Ford. The team from Ann Arbor seemed cut from a superior cloth, but in 1934, OSU's incoming coach, Francis Schmidt, broke through the mystique. When he was interviewed about the job, they were asking him, how are you going to beat Michigan? And he looked them right in the eye and he said, Just remember, they put their pants on the same way we do, one leg at a time. So when Ohio State beat them, they started the gold pants tradition. And ever since 1934, whenever Ohio State defeats Michigan, all the players and coaches get little replica gold pants. And that represents two of the final moments in my life. I have several of those pants myself. Uh, I don't mention that around here. Gold pants were immediately in style, as Ohio State thoroughly dominated the next four meetings, outscoring Michigan 114 to nothing. Hoping to reverse this unsettling trend, Michigan ushered in a new coach from the Ivy League who made his own sartorial impact. Michigan's new coach in 1938, Fritz Chrysler, had come from Princeton, and he created the winged helmet of maize and blue. It was done for two reasons. First, to dress up the helmet, because until then, Michigan just wore a plain old black leather helmet. But the second reason was he wanted to have the passers be able to spot the receivers better. In truth, no one needed a winged helmet to spot the ubiquitous Tom Harmon. In the 1940 meeting in Columbus, Harmon rushed for three scores, passed for two more, and intercepted three passes for good measure, leading to a 40 to nothing Michigan win and a standing ovation from the Buckeye faithful. Michigan added two more titles in 47 and 48 and held a decisive lead in the rivalry by the half-century mark. But despite winning just 12 of the first 46 meetings, Ohio State was a heavy favorite in 1950 in what became the most fabled contest in the game's history. On Friday of the night before the game, we went downtown to the National Wallach Hotel about 9.30, 10 o'clock, and everybody went to bed. But it was the next morning that was shocking. It was a blizzard. It was snowing big time. It was blowing big time. And it was about three above. 50,000 fans showed up. In snow swept Columbus, Ohio, a busy crew of snow shovelers worked through the night preparing the gridiron for the long awaited clash between Michigan and Ohio State. You'd be running and all of a sudden, you'd hit an icy spot, and your feet would go right up from under you, and you'd fall flat on your face. I sort of laid there in the snow, and I thought, I'm going to be left here to die. It's maybe the most unusual college football game ever played. There were 45 punts in that game. I punted the ball 24 times. We must have punted on first down 10 times. And I could not see their defensive backfield. With little visibility and unforgiving winds, the snowball turned into a game of hot potato. With each team punting the ball back in hopes the other side would make a mistake. The Buckeyes capitalized first by turning a blocked punt into a field goal by Heisman Trophy winner Dick Janowitz. A safety by the Wolverines made the score three to two. With under a minute left in the first half and a chance to run out the clock and retain a halftime lead, Ohio State coach Wes Fessler sent out his punter instead. 
Tony Thompson, the center for Michigan, went through and blocked Janowitz's punt, fell on the ball in the end zone for the game's only touchdown. Michigan won that game 9-3 without registering a single first down. And the field turns into a bedlam of overjoyed Wolverine rooters. It's a great victory for Michigan. Fessler never coaches another day at Ohio State. He's out. The Wolverines escaped Columbus and made an unplanned trip to the Rose Bowl. With snowdrifts reaching 25 feet, the Great Appalachian Storm of 1950 claimed the lives of dozens of Ohioans and the job of yet another Buckeyes coach. Ohio State had long been considered the graveyard of coaches, and the program's search for its 19th field general, its sixth in 12 seasons, yielded the uninspiring name Wayne Woodrow Hayes. Woody, as he was called, had led impressive teams at Denison University and Miami of Ohio. But after three unremarkable seasons in Columbus, which included two shutout losses to Michigan, it appeared Hayes' tenure would last only as long as it took to dig another grave. But in 1954, a funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. The turning point in that season is the fourth quarter of the Michigan game. Michigan comes to town under coach Benny Oosterbond and they take the opening kickoff and they drive the length of the field. The Buckeyes right before halftime tie the score 7-7. The third quarter is scoreless, but as play opens up in the fourth quarter. We took the ball down all the way to the one yard line and we had four shots at it. Michigan then rams that Ohio State line trying to get into the end zone and falls short. We had them on the ropes, man, it was awful. That goal line stand at the south end of Ohio Stadium in the 1954 Michigan game was truly the turning point in Woody Hayes' career. Spurred by the defense, Buckeye great Howard Hopalong Cassidy led OSU to a 21-7 victory, propelling the scarlet and gray to a surprising undefeated season in the 1954 National Championship. Beginning in 54, Woody's Buckeyes won 11 of 15 against the Wolverines and were crowned national champions again in 57 and 61. Woody Hayes had finally jammed a wedge in the revolving coaching door at Ohio State. More military tactician than X's and O's strategist, Hayes won with a brick and mortar approach, shunning the pass for three yards in a cloud of dust. In fact, Hayes' teams might have been called dull, if not for the man himself. I saw this older guy, real mild-mannered guy, and I didn't know he was General Patton in disguise. He's the guy you gotta hit him! You rush your butt off! Get off the field! He's the meanest sucker you've ever seen. I'll be a goddamn son of a bitch. If you're big and glisten! In practice, he would get so upset. For God's sake! That there was a fumble, or there was an interception, that he would bite his hand until it bled. He used to throw his hat down to stop it, and then he would grab the hat and just tear it apart. Snap his glasses. He took the watch off, threw the watch down, and jumped up and down on that. He looked like a raving madman. Oh, God damn you! Oh, well, shit. Woody Hayes once said, show me a gracious loser, and I'll show you a bus boy. You're damn right. If anybody gives you a compliment, kick him right in the shins, unless it's a lady over 80. But I tell you what, when you're out in practice field and you see that kind of emotion and intensity... Hell, there's no question who will win. Everyone's game elevates. <laughs> Nobody would ever outwork them. When we came in on summer practice at 7 in the morning, he was passed out on a couch at the facility and the projector was still going. He fell asleep watching film and hit Harrison, get up, get a shower, and go right back to work. Hayes's unflinching dedication and tyrannical temper were legendary, as was his disdain for the maize and blue. He would never refer to Michigan by name. Anytime he referred to the University of Michigan, it was always that team up north. They were recruiting a kid in Michigan, and as they were going south, they actually ran out of gas. He said that he would push his car across the state line before he would buy any gasoline in the state of Michigan. Woody Hayes was everything we loved. 
I did not like Woody Hayes. I didn't like anything about Woody Hayes. You know something? I couldn't care less about that. It all stems from my father's incredible distaste for his arrogance. And I don't think the players are worried about it any more than I am. If I had to pick one evil force in my life growing up as a grade school student here in Ann Arbor, it should be Brezhnev or somebody. It was Woody Hayes. If there was any question that Hayes reveled in the enmity of his foes, the 1968 encounter left no doubt. It was a close ball game. It was 14-14. And then all of a sudden, bingo. We got shellacked. Is this game ever going to end? Well, we couldn't stop them. And we couldn't do anything against them. And Woody showed no mercy. Well, Ohio State just exploded in the second half and ended up winning that game 50 to 14. A lot of the Michigan players were pretty upset at the end of the game because after Jim Otis had scored his fourth touchdown, he throws the football into the stands. Woody Hayes sent the offense back on the field for a two point conversion. And that was just to rub it in. That was just to stick it in our face. In the dressing room after the game, and one of the sports writers was asking Woody Hayes, hey, you were up by 36 points, the game's almost over, why would you go for two? His response, because they wouldn't let me go for three. Columbus was abuzz with Buckeye fever, as Ohio State followed its win over Michigan by beating O.J. Simpson's USC Trojans in the Rose Bowl. The Bucks' fourth national title under Woody Hayes was salt in the wound of Wolverine fans who were experiencing something unfamiliar from their beloved program, mediocrity. A losing record over 10 previous seasons had turned a once packed big house into a cavernous memorial to past UM glory. People cared about Michigan football, but had felt that it had sort of fallen on hard times. You could go up to the ticket counter and buy a ticket and walk on in. And there were many times when I'd sit down in the end zone as a high school student and they'd be half empty. 1951 to 1968, Michigan wins exactly one Big Ten title over an 18 year period. It's barely a rivalry there for a while. That all changed in 1969. The headline in the Detroit newspaper said, Bo Who? Bo Who? Bo Who? Glenn Schembechler got the nickname Bo from his little sister's attempts to say brother when they were young. Most everything else, he got from Woody Hayes. The Barberton, Ohio native and son of a fireman was an offensive tackle at Miami of Ohio during Hayes' tenure as Redskins coach. Beginning in 1958, Schembechler studied under Hayes for five seasons as a Buckeye assistant. The lessons paid off during six winning seasons as head coach of his alma mater, Miami. Despite his success, Michigan fans were left to wonder how a coach with such unnerving ties to the enemy recapture the program's once proud tradition. Then again, few are as keenly aware of Wolverine lore as a Buckeye. Michigan was not Michigan at that time. Michigan had a debt of a quarter million bucks. Their facilities were a mess. They had rickety old wooden chairs. They got dressed in the second floor of the basketball arena at the time. They hung their hats on rusty nails and two by fours bolted into the wall. We walked into the locker room that was supposedly be our dressing room here at Michigan and looked it up there and saw the nail on the wall. And we started complaining we had better facilities at Miami and this net and boasted. Better stuff at Miami. Gentlemen, see that rickety seat right there? Fielding Yost sat down in that seat. You see that rusty nail right there? Fielding Yost hung his hat on that rusty nail. We've got tradition here, Michigan tradition, and that's something no one else has. The first task was to get their attention, and he got it right away. He said, I will treat you all the same like dogs. He was the Tasmanian devil that came into town in a whirlwind of dust, and we were left in his wake. He worked us to death. He had about 140, 150 guys on the team when he took over. Every day, three or four people were leaving. He just waved at them on their way out the door. Guys were quitting left and right. At the end of spring practice, he's down about 75 or 80. In the locker room, Bo had put up a sign that said, those who stay will be champions. 
those who stay will be champions. It is still the mantra by which every Michigan football player lives because that sign still hangs in the locker room. It was Bo's sign. When he came in, he knew the team he had to beat was Ohio State. Ohio State was the scourge of the Big Ten, the scourge of the country. Ohio State is undefeated. They are the returning national champions. Sports Illustrated said they were so good. The only game worth watching right now in college football is Ohio State's offense versus their defense in full pad practice on Tuesday in Columbus. They were that overpowered. 200 miles to the north, those who stayed got off to an unspectacular 3-2 and two start. But four straight wins, in which they outscored their opponents 178 to 22, raised the Wolverines' confidence going into their season-ending matchup with the mighty Buckeyes, a game they had been thirsting for since Woody went for two. We had a great week of practice because we were all motivated by what Woody had done the previous year. Bo made every player on the team practice with a sign taped to his helmet that said 50 to 14. The score was posted all over the locker room, and I made sure they didn't forget it. Every demonstration player that was playing against our first and second team, getting ready for that game, wore the number 50. Everybody was 50. That was embedded in the minds of these guys. That embarrassment was not going to last long. 103,588 fans in the Michigan Stadium in Ann Arbor. I walked up to the press box. Guy jumps out and grabs me and shakes me and says, we're going to beat your ass today, buddy. The head coach of Ohio State, Woody Hayes. I'm 11 and a half years old. I remember like elbowing my dad and saying, Dad, you know, Woody can't hear you. <laughs> we're in the 50th row. OSU, a 17-point favorite, led early. But Michigan struck back with two Garvey Craw touchdowns, the second set up by Billy Taylor's electrifying run. Then an unheralded senior from tiny St. Ignace, Michigan, got a hold of the ball. He's running away from us. We're in the end zone. I remember him just running, and we're kind of like pushing him, you know, like, go, go. He's got a man working for him, cuts to the 10, and is down on the four-yard line. Barry Pearson's 60-yard return set up another score. The Wolverines held a 24-12 lead at the half, the first time all season that Ohio State trailed in intermission. But it only got worse as Michigan's impenetrable defense snapped Ohio State's 22-game win streak and secured the biggest upset in the history of the rivalry. They played a, a flawless football game. Uh, I swore Bo was in the huddle. It is intercepted by Michigan's Barry Pearson. Woody was befuddled that day. Bo Schembechler, the student, out coach, and the teacher. It was not a fluke. Michigan just flat out kicked their ass that day. There's an expression in German called Schadenfreude, which means joy in the misery of others. Forty years later, I feel Schadenfreude, joy that it still hurts the Buckeyes, what we did on that fateful November day in 1969. That game kind of set it off. Woody was crushed that his greatest team would be beaten. When Ohio State got back from that huge loss at Ann Arbor in 1969, Woody Hayes went right to his office and began working that night on the 1970 game. Hayes had a huge rug made that he put outside the Ohio State dressing room that the players had to walk over as they went out to practice every day in the springtime. And that rug said, Michigan 24, Ohio State 12, we walked across that damn rug every day. Well, I still have the bumper sticker saying, remember Ann Arbor, cars would have them on the back, you'd be driving around. I mean, it was amazing. When we got off that bus in Columbus, man, they were ready for us. There were signs on the dormitories. 
They were not G-rated. <laughs> Woody was as tight as a drum. Don't you know who we play this week? Don't you know who it is? My God, it's Michigan. It's Michigan. And he's crying, and tears are coming down his cheeks. And I thought, whoa. Boy, the old man has really lost it. He's using Michigan, and he's using it repetitively. The 70 battle in Columbus was a combination of all our frustrations that whole year. And it wasn't going to be pretty. Out for blood, Ohio State disposed of Michigan 20 to 9. Fanning the flames of animosity between the schools were two men who brooded over the game with an angst that permeated through their programs and the regions as a whole. Stay for the remainder of the decade, the regular season was mere window dressing for this annual year-end clash, a period remembered as the Ten-Year War. It became more real, and it became more serious. And you spent your whole year, you spent your whole off-season getting ready for that one game. We thought of this one more than we have the rest of the season put together. When he brought his team up here, he would tell one of his assistants, he said, would you please tell Coach Jim Beckler that I'm ready to meet him at the 50-yard line. He would not cross the 50, and so I'd shake hands across the 50. I would, he, I move, and that was it. <laughs> for 10 years. I want to beat him. He's no friend of mine. The one thing that he said that really stuck out with me is he said, this is more than a game. This is war. Everything happens. You've got it all. Intrigue, injustice, devastation. You can go straight to hell. Every storyline possible. Bo Schimbeckler has to be restrained. Woody Hayes is furious. He is screaming. He just ripped up the downs marker. I mean, who does that? Woody Hayes did that. A 10-7 Michigan victory in 1971 was the first in a series of blood-boiling close calls. In 1972, a defiant Schembechler twice passed up easy field goals, only to twice be denied at the goal line, resulting in a 14-11 Ohio State win. Both schools entered the 1973 matchup undefeated, as the fourth-ranked Wolverines played the top-ranked Buckeyes to a 10-10 tie. Statistically, Michigan dominated and fully expected a trip to the Rose Bowl. But a vote by Big Ten athletic directors sent Ohio State instead. The slight infuriated Schembechler, who insisted his team was robbed. This is the lowest day in my athletic career, either as a player or a coach, because I am bitterly resentful at the way this thing was handled. Painfully reminiscent of two crucial misses in the 73 game, Mike Lantry's just inches wide kick time expired on the 74 showdown, left Michigan with a two-point loss. Lantry walks disconsolately to the sideline. It concluded an excruciating three-year stretch for the Wolverines, in which they won every one of their games, except for those against the Buckeyes. But Arch, I felt you had another great day today, and he'd rather have that victory than all those 31 games put together. Isn't that right? Sure. A local high school legend, raised in the shadows of the horseshoe, Archie Griffin rushed for over 5,500 yards in his four seasons as a Buckeye. And despite being college football's only two-time Heisman Trophy winner, he regards his three gold pants as his most satisfying awards. His last pair came in 1975, which gave the Buckeyes a 4-2-1 advantage in the 10-year war. The rivalry reached the national stage, and tensions between the coaches spiraled from Midwestern machismo to Cold War paranoia. He stopped practice and he said, men, you see those two guys? Those are police. I hired them. Bo was trying to watch our practices. Never forget the year that Bo brought the police in and went to one of the apartments across the way and found a guy shooting a video camera over the top of the wall at their practice and thought he was a spy from Ohio State. Are the elements of my strategy all safe? How's the field gonna be cut? Who's it gonna favor? Woody was convinced one year 
that Michigan had a new shoe specifically made so that if the field were slippery, Michigan would have better grip. And Woody tried like crazy to find out so he could order some. And there was no secret shoe. The week we were playing Michigan at Michigan, my senior year, we were having our pregame meal. The ladies that were serving us were all nice looking ladies. I mean, nice looking ladies, college students. And all of a sudden we heard that clank. He hit that wine glass with a fork and he starts screaming. I want all of these waitresses out of here. I want the cooks to serve my men. And we're looking around, what? And then he stood up and said, Bo planted them there to distract us. Yeah, Bo infiltrated our lunchroom. He goes, we'll have none of that. Their ongoing feud further provoked fan partisanship between the states. A fanaticism reinforced to this day by the colliding cultures of each side. This is not just a rivalry between two football teams. This is a rivalry between two ways of life. This is scarlet red versus maize and blue. This is a battle between goodness and evil. Michigan represents the good. You are a Michigan man. You stand for something excellent. You stand for tradition, respect, integrity. When you talk about a Michigan fan, you are talking about Satan incarnate. Makes me sick even to say the name of their state. We're very proud of the Wolverine, and we know that the Ohio State people have the Buckeye. And we also know that the Buckeye is a hairless nut. Have you been to Michigan? The entire state smells like hot dog water. It's horrifying. But we don't pay a lot of attention to the fans from Ohio State, as far as I remember. We like to think we're a little higher educated. They call us the arrogant asses as a result. AA is for arrogant asses, not Ann Arbor. We consider them just slightly redneckish. Go Bucks! University of Michigan always has been a hell of a school. It's a first-rate academic school. Face it, Michigan was superior to Ohio State and remains superior. We had a Michigan guy flunk out of Michigan, and then he enrolled at Ohio State. And he raised a class standing at both universities when he did that. I'm a Michigan graduate. You're an Ohio State graduate. You're lucky you're not flipping burgers someplace. You ain't nothing but a bunch of pretend wannabe crybaby suck asses. We looked down our noses at Ohio State. Why their noses are in the air because we have kicked their asses so far up into the air they can't get their damn noses back down straight again fuck michigan excuse me michigan has a great spirited fan base and ohio state has a great spirited fan base with violent lunatic sociopathic fringe attached to it Anything that loud, obnoxious. We are in uh, the city of Columbus on the campus of the Ohio State University. required by law to do that thing that they just did and also apparently to own five red hooded sweatshirts each. We're from Ohio, O-H. We're from Ohio, I-O. We don't give a damn for the whole state of Michigan. We're Since when is being passionate about something bad? Ohio State fans can seem like they're a little crazy on the outside. But for better or worse, this is who we are. This is what we get behind. We get behind our Buckeyes. And this whole town lives and breathes and dies Ohio State football. If 
From the time I was six years old, I only missed one Ohio State football game until I was 20. That's all there was in Columbus. We didn't have Broadway plays, we didn't have opera, we didn't have great museums. This is what we had. When I was a kid, there were eight radio stations in Columbus. And on Saturday afternoons, all eight stations carried the Ohio State game. I don't know one kid from my high school that doesn't have a baby picture with Buckeye stuff. The way the kids are raised, it's not a basketball state, it's not a soccer state, um, it's a football state. You have to understand that in Columbus, Ohio, football is a secular religion. This is the evangelism of this part of the heartland. Singular in its focus. in the manner that if you take a magnifying glass and hold it over an ant in the sun, it's everything. I love Ohio State football, I'm a fan. I wouldn't say that I'm like a crazy psycho fan. I'm able to step back and realize that, hey, excuse me, it's, uh, I believe it's Coach Tressel calling. Yes, Coach. I don't know how many sets of ashes have been scattered somewhere near that field. It's a lot of people's wishes. It's a lot of people's dreams. There's an O on that ball cap that they want placed in their casket next to them. You could talk to people in the autumn here who want to live just long enough to see Ohio State kick the hell out of Michigan one more time. I could never figure out where this bile came from. I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan. Fuck the Wolverines. I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan, I hate Michigan. Fuck the Wolverines. Michigan and Ohio have been at each other's throats since people were writing down history on this continent. Wolverine lost to Buckeye, and there was many a black guy to attest to the upset. The game is over, but the mayhem lingers on. Animosity in the region existed long before there was a football field to settle the score. In fact, it dates back to 1835, after Michigan had petitioned for statehood and discovered that through a land survey error, part of its territory, the Toledo Strip, had been claimed by the state of Ohio. Michigan and Ohio militias engaged in an angry, though bloodless, border dispute that ended with Toledo remaining a part of Ohio. Nearly two centuries later, border towns like Perrysburg, Ohio, are the disputed territories, with football allegiance now up for grabs. The Michigan-Ohio border serves as a 70-mile-long line of scrimmage that creates a too-close-for-comfort coexistence between rival fan factions. Be it in the classroom or at the local trading post, where a young Wolverine can be outfitted in maize and blue, and a Buckeye nut can buy a Buckeye nut. But weary travelers through these parts take heed. Knowing who the locals root for is Rivalry 101. So there was John Kerry in Ohio before the presidential election, and he praises the Ohio State Buckeye football team. There is nothing better than Buckeye football, period. That's the way it works. But then he goes to a suburb of Detroit. We're roughly 60, 70 percent Democratic. Our high schools are named after John F. Kennedy and Harry Truman. Um, he could have said anything. The Falcons, and then he mentioned himself, you know, I just go for Buckeye football. I just go for Buckeye football. That's where I'm coming out. But...
<laughs> that was while I was in Ohio. Now I know I'm in the state of Michigan, and you got a great big M and a powerhouse of a team. This guy is a flip-flopper. Carsados has Carter. We believe the football in Ohio is a lot better, so the quality of the players are better. We feel no need to go across the board to get any of their, um, what they call, talented players. It is no secret Michigan has long stocked its cupboard with Ohio natives. Living next door to one of the nation's most fertile grounds for high school talent, who can blame them? That it causes resentment in the Buckeye State only adds to the rivalry. But while some Ohioans are willing to cross the border in search of gridiron glory, for others, it's not even an option. My dad said, okay, where are you gonna go? I said, dad, I wanna go to Michigan. And he said, you traitor, I'll tell you where you're going. You're going right down to 71 South and you're gonna play for the Ohio State Buckeyes. And there was number 36, Mr. Spielman. Better not go there, don't ever come home if you do. So, <laughs> there, that's good parenting, isn't it? But where would Michigan football be without players from Ohio? It wouldn't be where it is today, I promise you that. Many of our best players come from the state of Ohio, and trust me, that really pisses them off. Uh, Jim Manage, number 88, El Diablo, the great All-American tight end. Obviously, Michigan was the better place. It was a very easy decision to make. And if that's smug Michigan arrogance, deal with it, Buckeyes. John Colasar is from Ohio, he kills us. Charles Woodson, also from Ohio, ended up being a legend at Michigan. And there he goes! Charles Woodson down the sideline! He's going to go all the way! Touchdown, Michigan! So I don't know what they did to Desmond Howard to get him. They must have had something on his family, or somebody was kidnapped or something. I stepped back and caught the ball on the seven-yard line. I made the first guy miss. Then I move to my left, so now I'm running down the Ohio State sideline. I'm looking at the punter. I'm like, that's that's just totally unfair. There's no way in hell he's gonna catch me. One man. Come on. I'm thinking, should I do it? Should I not? Should I do it? Should I not? And I'm really wrestling with myself about this. I crossed the goal line. I was like, hey, fuck it, and I did it. You don't even have to say Desmond Howard. You can just say Heisman Post. And it's just, oh, God, it's brutal. It's brutal. The dream in Ohio is to stop all these defectors if they could only build a fence around the state. Stop those traders from going up north, then they could establish long term dominance over Michigan, which might be true, but they've never been able to do it to their enormous frustration. They don't forget those who kick their ass. I just put it to you like that. So when I'm down there, I take it as a compliment. I tell them, thank you very much. Daz, man, you suck. Thank you very much. Daz, man, fuck you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Led by three-time All-Big Ten quarterback Rick Leach, the Wolverines put a blue and maize stamp on the 10-year war with victories in 1976, 77, and 78. A beleaguered Woody Hayes saw his Buckeyes outscored 50 to nine in the three games. The 10-year tally slid in Michigan's favor five to four with one tie. Both Jim Beckler is taking the major of Woody Hayes, three years in a row. Five weeks later, Woody Hayes' career in the 10-year war came to a sudden, shameful end. Wister looks at Conway, throws a shot at him. I was watching the game on television, and I saw the punch, and I said, you've just seen the last game Woody Hayes will ever coach. I was sad, but I understood that that was the only way that Woody could go out. He was, like Melville's Ahab, and ended up being taken down, pinioned to his obsession. Football. This is Michigan, the biggest game I've ever coached, and the one thing I love to do is beat them.
Yeah, I looked over and they had their helmets off and they had a banner around here. They had something on it and I was standing back there. I don't allow banner. What the heck are they doing? So I walked over there and I saw Earl written on. I said, oh my God. Earl Bruce had the unenviable task of replacing Woody Hayes. But in his nine seasons in Columbus, he became the third winningest head coach in Buckeye history and posted a winning record against the Wolverines. We don't give a damn for the whole state of Michigan. We're from Ohio. But at the tail end of a mediocre season, Bruce was unceremoniously fired prior to the 1987 Michigan game. And in Earl Bruce's final appearance for Ohio State, his Buckeyes are really playing well. Then you know that old saying, you find a way to win. Touchdown. They found a way to win. And it was all with the heart. Not with anything else, they did it with heart. Bruce's successor was an immediate hit, but not in Columbus. I love John Cooper. John Cooper was great. Coach Cooper is a Hall of Fame coach. His stats say that. But again, when you're talking about Ohio State, I don't care what his record is. What's his record against Michigan? In the course of 13 years, they won two games over Michigan. So poor John. John Cooper said, Michigan is just another game. He said that. His 1995 team was one of the best Ohio State teams ever assembled, featured Eddie George, the Heisman Trophy winner at tailback. The Michigan team had already lost three times. They come into Michigan, and some guy that a lot of people, whose name they can't even pronounce, Tishimanga Biakabatuka, runs wild. Biakabatuka, Biakabatuka, and Biakabatuka finds some space. The elusive Tim Biakabatuka, Tishimanga Biakabatuka. Bianca Batuka made a name for himself by rushing for a rivalry record 313 yards and spoiling one of several Ohio State seasons in the 1990s. Never fully embracing the magnitude of the rivalry, Cooper was replaced in 2001 by someone who clearly did. How about a great big Buckeye welcome for Jim Dressel? The day he was announced as Ohio State's head coach, ironically, Ohio State was playing a basketball game that evening against the University of Michigan. He said, you'll be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you very much. Yes. Finally, we have a coach that gets it. When that day came that I got to roll up my sleeves and go to work and see if I could be worthy of coaching at The Ohio State University, I knew one thing for sure. I better be prepared for a game that's unlike any other. I keep talking Trestle up to every NFL owner I see. I got to get this guy out of Columbus. This guy's got to go away. Jim Trestle, a coach's son from Mentor, Ohio, delivered in his initial test against Michigan in 2001. Hand off Corrad, he'll bounce out. A victory over the Wolverines the following year secured a berth in the national title game versus Miami. And the Buckeyes are headed to the desert. Under pressure, throws it. Incomplete. The Buckeyes win. Now the party begins for the Ohio State Buckeyes. Tressel's record of success against that team from up north, five wins in six seasons, evoked memories of Woody Hayes. Long forgiven for his controversial exit, Hayes remains a larger-than-life figure whose spirit endures in Columbus. If you say Woody, it could only be one person. Still very much endeared to the public here. And it's a little bit like being in love with a very beautiful woman who has a broken nose. Coming into Columbus is like driving into Memphis and coming to Graceland. Woody is our Elvis. You can go anywhere, and there's going to be posters of Woody, pictures of Woody. There's going to be old men dressed like Woody. I've got two pictures in my workout room at home, and one of them is Woody. When it's snowing with a short sleeve shirt and his little Woody hat on, that was him. Woody Hayes cared about Ohio State University, cared about the state of Ohio. He's meant so much to so many people, and that's something that they'll never, ever forget. Hayes's bond with Ohioans was unmistakable. 
when the smoke cleared from the Ten Year War, a deep connection was also revealed with his supposed nemesis. Their on-field bravado no longer casting a shadow on their mutual affection. Whether he realized it or not, I was his best friend in coaching. I was his best friend. When I had a heart attack at the Rose Bowl, he wrote me a very nice letter. When I came back and was recuperating in my house, he came to see me. He's the type of man that has brought great credit to college football. He's a great, great friend of mine. And he always will be. Your whole life pivots around one game. Your whole life is devoted for one purpose, and that's to beat the other guy. Who else in the world could understand you? Bo and Woody respected each other and loved each other. I had a speech at the Agonis Club in Dayton. They had talked to Woody earlier in the year about coming down and introducing me. He was too frail to do it. But he would not, he would not take no for an answer. So he had a kid drive him down in his truck. He could hardly walk. And he got up there for a half hour and talked about our relationship. His voice was not as strong as it usually was, but you could hear a pin drop out there. He's just a good man and a great, great friend whose friendship, I can't tell you how much I love. And after that, Woody went home and died. That guy was a hell of a man. And those 10 years, me on one side and him on the other, I wouldn't change that for anything in the world. Bo Schembechler shared his final account of the game just two days prior to the most anticipated meeting in the rivalry's history. He soaked up Michigan Stadium one last time. But the following morning, he was gone. While taping a local television program, Schembechler's heart gave out. He was 77. Memorials spread far and wide in Ann Arbor and quickly extended across state lines. Though he died a conquering hero, Bo Schembechler was born and raised a sturdy son of Ohio. Football, Michigan, Ohio, lost a fine man, a fine coach, a fine dad. Would you mind just bowing your head? And that little prayer from Pastor. We bid goodbye to one of our own one who was a great competitor and who loved the game and who will be missed sorely. On the third Saturday in November of 2006, the Ohio State Buckeyes and Michigan Wolverines met for the 103rd time. Both undefeated, it marked the first occasion the teams entered the game as the number one and number two ranked schools in the country. And once the curtain was finally drawn, these century-old rivals put on a show for the ages. The game unfolded like a celebration, a hundred-yard homage to all who played, coached, and cheered throughout this storied rivalry. In the end, the schools combined for the series' highest point total in 99 meetings. It was Ohio State which prevailed 42 to 39, immortalizing a fresh crop of victors in Buckeye lore. ritual, the Michigan-Ohio State rivalry is as ingrained in Midwestern culture as stoicism and self-reliance. Like the fruits of the season's harvest, the game is a gift, a cycle of life 
that links generations and bonds hostile neighbors. Because beneath the bitterness that coats their epic feud, the teams grudgingly maintain a mutual and abiding respect. They are companion pieces in history, each side's legacy continually tied to the others. The objective to beat Ohio State, we accomplished. Yeah. One of the things that makes the Michigan-Ohio State game so great and separates it from other sports rivalries is not only does it happen once a year, it happens at the same time every year. And all great traditions in most cultures happen at the same time, so there's a sense memory of when it happens. So you feel like you're not just seeing a game, you're seeing a historical event that we remember. It's a beautiful thing. You feel you are a part of something that stretches from before you existed and will be here long after you are gone. The way it was with our grandparents. Go blue! Go blue! Go blue. <laughs> it's the way it was with our parents. It's the way it is with us. It's the way it's going to be with our children and grandchildren cold, dark, forbidding sky of that late November day in Ann Arbor or in Columbus. It does set a tone for the whole winter with either being the victor or having been humiliated by your rival. If you don't think it's a big deal around here, ask the guy who lost it. It's a stigma you carry for 364 days until you get a chance to remove it and get that blemish off your soul. And they look at gray flannel skies for months on end and you're thinking about, we gotta beat those sons of bitches the next time. How do you make Michigan cookies? Put them in a big bowl and beat them for three hours. How do you get an OSU grad off your porch? You pay him for the pizza. Four, five, six, seven. What do you call a Michigan Wolverine with a national championship ring? A thief. A Michigan fan and an OSU fan are in the third grade. Who's bigger? The OSU fan. He's 18. This has been a presentation of HBO Sports.